Well, hello everybody and welcome to this week's, this week's, no, this month's episode of Wheel Tapping. Uh, I would quickly run out of content uh, if I were to do this weekly because that's about how often I get to play. So <laughs> we can't do that on this show. I am joined today by Mr. Tony Fryer to discuss, we're going to be talking about 1889 today. How you doing, Tony? Doing quite well, sir. Thank you for asking. Hope you're doing well as also. I am. I am. I'm loving life. Apparently, so good. Apparently, my tongue's not so well. Oh, blah, blah, blah. Well, it's you been know, a long you, day. You know, behind the scenes, we usually record in the morning, you know, and it's yeah. kind of a different vibe. Uh, but tonight, you're in my territory. It's late night, and this is, this is kind of where I live. So, well, it's almost bedtime. No, not there yet. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting old, but I'm not that old. All right. So Tony and I have been playing 1889. Now, to be honest, we don't have a ton of plays. Um, I don't necessarily think you need them for this one, but I still thought we should have somebody who has had a lot more experience recently playing it. So we brought in from, from the Rival podcast, um, we brought in Mr. John Hollander. How are you doing, John? Good, Chris. How you doing? <laughs> Great. Thanks so, for having me on. Great. So why don't you just tell the nice folks? I mean, come on. Like, I, I know that the people listening should probably listen to you already, but let, let's let's give a quick plug for the uh, the show that you do real quick. Sure. Yeah. So we uh, train shuffling. That's uh, Eric Hyden and I. We record every couple of weeks, uh, maybe once a month. Uh, but we also have our associated YouTube channel, Board Game Informant, and we do about a bi-weekly 18xx stream on there. Yeah, you're, you and, are, uh, a, you guys are a lot more brave, you and Bankruptcy Club, with doing these streams, because uh, I, <laughs> man, people see a picture when we play, and they call out things. I can't imagine what it must be like oh, when yeah. you're actually <laughs> playing, having people call you it out. Was, uh, it was tough. It was tough in the beginning. Uh, we had poor lighting. We had poor audio. Mm. We weren't very familiar with 18xx. Our, our first couple of streams of 89 and 46 were really, really long. And uh, we got lots of comments on rules, mistakes and things like that. But we've gotten a lot better at it now. And we have a, a much better setup. I refinished the basement and turned it into a little studio. And Nice. Uh, We've gotten mostly positive comments since then, so. Good. I mean, it's uh, it's it's a tricky thing to film because there is so much action going on at a table that it's, I mean, that's a lot to capture. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of mental math. So it's yeah. not the liveliest of crowds at times. Yeah, it definitely is. Uh, it's definitely more fun to do these as live streams. We tried recording at first before we started doing live streams and it can get pretty boring, but it's a lot more fun when we're interacting with people watching the stream sure. while we're playing. Awesome. awesome. A lot more fun than just watching four people sitting there in silence doing mental math. <laughs> <laughs> so, so real quick in a nutshell, um, what has been your 18xx journey? Cause you, you're on this and it's rel a lot newer than it is for say the master Tony and, um, the, the apprentice myself, um, <laughs> uh, where, where are you in the journey here? So still still fairly early on i think i'm up to about 30 uh actually i know it's 32 okay. total plays of 18xx <laughs> and it bad. started about two and a half years ago with 1889 <clears throat> which uh which we'll talk about a little bit later but that was a, a <laughs> and quite, you're still playing quite long that's the and brutal thing. first experience <laughs> <laughs> you're still playing that's the important takeaway here. right didn't get yeah, scared so off. The first, the first two years were was uh, you know a game every once in a blue moon. I didn't really catch the bug right away because mm -hmm. it, after the first couple of games, you know, we played eighty nine and we played forty six and then we played uh, fifty six and they were all about six hours. <laughs> and I just thought eighteen xx games were all six hours long, <laughs> and uh, so we always had to schedule them on a Saturday night and. 
we were finishing up at you know two in the morning so it wasn't something we thought was really feasible to do very frequently and it wasn't until about six to eight months ago that I really started catching the bug. And since then, we've been playing a ton of 18xx. And we're getting even some of the quote unquote longer games finished in the four hour range. So uh, we've gotten a lot faster and it makes the whole genre a lot more enjoyable. Right. And I also think, you know, when you start out, there's this uh, and and I still get it. And I, I kind of feel bad for for my friend Kelly with 22 last night because he he was he was way down like something just tore, he he had the lawnmower and he and he just somehow managed to not get any miners and it just was really rough but like i was doing really well <laughs> so like i don't want to call the game but at the same time i think there's a responsibility and we talked about that uh at length online at one point and i think your ability to recognize and concede victory kind of helps speed things up sometimes because you'll start a game and you'll just start going and then you'll realize, oh, wait, you know, this it's obviously going to be him because he has way more shares and he's just already running for money. So I think we can see that a little bit better as we play longer, which helps speed things up. Yeah, I think it kind of depends. You know, I've seen granted, I've only, I'm only in the, the low 30s on, on plays right now, but I've seen too many games where somebody's called called it you know we haven't called the game per se but somebody says oh you know bob is clearly the winner and then bob comes in a close second behind somebody else yeah. and i'm not quite there yet where i where i think that at least i don't think i'm good enough at calling a game early to want to pack it up and not see how it really plays out and that's you know what that's one of those things i think you need to your group needs to have an understanding because I, I be honest with you, somebody's probably going to be butthurt in that scenario, right? Because somebody wants to see the outcome, whether it's the person who's just blazing ahead in the wind, wants to see how far they can win. And maybe, you know, I, our fight for the middle. Yeah, he did come in last. And the person he predicted was going to come in first came in first. But the, it was very scrappy in the middle and it was a lot of fun. And, you know, I ended up getting a strong second, even though I was still almost. $2,500 away from first place. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wait, and that was in 22? Yeah. Yeah. It, it was like 16, like 16, one, and then like 13 and change. It was my score. And the, wow. the lowest score was like in the eights. So it was rough. Was that the but, full 22 or MRS? Oh, uh, that was the big boy. Oof. So, all right. Well, enough 22. We've already done that one. Fair enough. All right. So we are. So that's a little bit about Johnny. I do encourage you guys to check out his show as well. Um, you know, while our goal here on this show is to just lightly dive or I'm sorry, deeply dive and cover one game only. Um, ignore that last conversation. Um, really deep dive on one game and, you know, kind of really focus in on it and give you what it's about and give you enough thoughts about it that you can make a decision whether you want to hunt this die down whether you want to wait for uh spoilers the kickstarter coming soon uh or anything like that so um let's get into 1889 so i'm going to let's put up this because i mean that, that final map is pretty so we can look at it so 1889 was initially designed in 2004 uh, by uh, Sutaka Ikeyada. I'm so bad at names. I should not have. <laughs> I should not get that job at all. Um, Yasutaka Ikeda. There you go. Thank you. Um, apologies for any pronunciation errors there. Um, but this is published by Deep Thought Games. It was licensed by All Aboard Games. And recently was announced that Grand Trunk Games will be redoing a reprint of this, uh, which they intend to do on Kickstarter in the very near future. It plays two to six. I don't know why I'd ever play this with six, um, <laughs> but it can. No. I think the box says five, the rules say My six. My box says five. <laughs> so I, I would argue like, well. Mine says three to four. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two to five. Wow. So, yeah, there's all that stuff. Um, and they say it plays in about one and a half to two and a half hours. I think Johnny will have something to say about that at a later time. In my experience with 
experienced players, this definitely hops in the two hour range. So it can definitely be a school night game uh, and you can get it to the table pretty, pretty easily. So there's that. So comparisons to 1830. It's going to compare a lot. If you, if you want to draw the 18xx family tree, which is a project I'm working on that I need to get back to, uh, you could pretty much draw a straight branch from 30 right down to 89. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't stray too far from the mix here. However, it does, while it has the same train set uh, and the rules are very similar, the float's a little different. It's a 50% float. Uh, to full cap. So money's half off, not 40% off, uh, which is nice. It does have all designated home stations. It's a much smaller bank. It's 7,000 as opposed to the 12,000 in 30 and other games. And it has one less company because it's only going to do seven instead of the eight, which may come up when we start talking about trains again, because you only have seven companies buying the exact same amount of trains let's see here we talked about you brought up track upgrades that 89 says you got to be able to run the new track or be a city town whereas in 30 you have to be able to run some of the track what do you what do you mean by that distinction sir yeah i think um i think johnny you actually brought this up right there's some difference in uh, what you're yeah. allowed in uh, track placements yeah so uh I guess to to use the um, the eighteen xx vernacular, it's, it's the the restrictive, the semi restrictive versus permissive. For those that don't know what that means, when, when you upgrade a tile and it's permissive, you just have to be able to run on that tile. So you don't have to run on the new track, but you just have to be able to run on any track on the tile. With semi restrictive, you have to be able to run on the new piece of track, or it has to be a city that you're upgrading. You have to upgrade the revenue. So, <clears throat> so where in, does that in eighty nine it's semi restrictive versus the permissive track lay in eighteen thirty. So where does that generally kind of come into play? Because the only time I can really see that is if you're using uh, like the one company to help another company. You know, you're trying to get their tile to meet up, and one's trying to help the other one. But if it's not going to be able to be run, then he can't. They can't like help each other as much is that really the only case that you're going to see that kind of come up uh, i see it in um like in 1831 when people are trying to lay those those complex crossing tracks that you know they, they, the track that goes like this or the bow and arrow or <laughs> you know i'm trying to lay this but i can't run the new part but i need that there for my other company right yeah okay so i i always thought it was um when when you're trying to backtrack to lay a tile, you, can, you can't backtrack. So sometimes it makes it in semi-restrictive difficult uh, to lay a track mm -hmm. if the turn is facing the wrong way. And mm -hmm. uh, but it was recently pointed out to me that the permissive track. So I thought I thought semi-restrictive made it more difficult to lay track. Um, and it sounds like it would from the name. But what was pointed out to me recently was that permissive track lay allows for you to be a lot more offensive with the track lay because you don't need to be able to run on the new track, so you can actually use it to cut people off, even when it doesn't impact your company's roots at all. So I've, I've heard permissive is a lot more brutal than semi-restrictive. I also heard Scuttlebutt, and I've never actually played it, that there's a beginner version of this game, which makes sense because when 89 came out, it was kind of, this was its, its area of expertise, was it was supposed to be a good learning game, um, the beginner game apparently adds more track. Uh, this is one of the few games that I found, like I ran out of gentle curve towns. <laughs> I ran out in this game. So it, it's a little tighter on the track pool. So I guess they loosen that up. And then the privates are really just dealt out uh, randomly. And then they don't actually have powers and they can't be bought in. I, I don't know about you guys, but to me, that's like, that's two really core things that I think new players need to experience. You know, yeah. I, I don't think your first turn needs to be like, or your first game needs to be brutal, but I think at the same time, you need to put somebody's hand near a fireplace to let them know it's hot. <laughs> so you need to tell them 
tile will run out. Like 30 does it because they have all the straight cities, which I think is super restrictive. Uh, and it kind of beats that over the head. And same thing with Chesapeake for that matter, where it's, you know, there's a lot of restrictions in what the tile looks like. But this one, it's, I think it's restricted by quantity. Um, yeah, any I thoughts think, on that? Any desire to play that game or anything? I don't have any desire to play it. I, I think, I don't mind the extra track tiles. I think that's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that it really probably detract, detracts too much from the game. Even losing the initial private auction doesn't bother me that much, but the, the inability to buy privates into companies, I think is a, a pretty big aspect of a lot of 18xx games. And I think taking that yeah. out of it is a big blow to the game. Right, and I think that there's two privates that are huge in this game. One is that extra port, and the other is the Mountain Buster. So you're taking two very helpful privates out of the game. And you know what? It It's not that hard to explain how that works. When you don't worry about it, we'll talk about it when Phase 3 happens. And then you just talk about how privates work and how you buy them in and things like that. It's I don't think it's that hard in the teach genre of things either but maybe that's just me yeah i think the the powers that i think are somewhat useful but i don't think that taking them away is too bad i think it it does if you're talking about ease of uh easing somebody into the genre mm -hmm. not having to worry about combinations between companies and privates i could see that maybe being helpful i agree with you it's really not that hard to explain but Yep. Um, I think the real value in the privates is getting money out of your company to be able to buy shares or start a new company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know what? That was also, I would argue, probably one of the hardest things for me to learn how to manage the cash in my company and be able to actually extract double value for privates. I think, you know, yeah. the earlier you can get somebody on those training wheels, the better, because I think that it's not... There's a balancing act to be done there. Like how do how many trains do I buy? Can I afford to lay track? And then still give myself the hundred and twenty dollars that I need to take out of the company. I think that's a right. That that's a delicate balance you need to kind of get the feel for. So I think it would also slow the game down to not be able to extract money from companies. True. No, I definitely think so. So play it at your own peril sounds to be our advice. We don't have any hands-on experience with it, but I still think it has some value to the right crowd, perhaps. Maybe you are, you know, I think we, we sometimes forget, like for me, I had a great 18xx group that taught me how to play. Like they're, they brought it in and to this day, We'll, we'll put a game out and I'll be like, all right, what do I need to know? What are the differences? What are the MacGuffins? You can go. But it's only because I had a group to teach me. And I think sometimes that it's easy to forget that there's somebody reading a rule book somewhere who is just super overwhelmed. So if you can say, take this chunk, worry about it later in your group, it if that's how it gets you started, then I, I would rather you get started than sit there and not play because of this little section of rules. <laughs> yeah, I teach cooking and people ask me all the time. They're like, oh, I'm not a very good cook. I'm like, do you buy your own food? Do you do you buy anything in a box? If you're buying food and you're cooking food, you're already ahead of the game. You're, you're better than a lot of people. So I kind of feel the same thing here. If you're, as long as you're playing, as long as you're getting into it, you'll get the rest. Don't worry about it. Yeah, All right. having learned through a rule book with two other players who had never played 18xx before, I can definitely attest to it being a, oh. an overwhelming first experience without having somebody there to guide you through it. I I can only imagine that's that's got to be, yeah, that's got to be very daunting. Even even when I get a new game now, it's like it's stressful to read through that rule book because I that. I'm not that kind of a learner, so I know that about me, <laughs> and it's it's stressful. So I can't imagine having to be somebody who has to, oh, you need to learn this and bring it back and teach the group. Big shoes. That's what I do. <laughs> you know, you're geared that way. You are. There are people who actually enjoy reading rule books. <laughs> I am not one of them. <laughs> it's it's the thing that will literally put me to sleep every time, and I have to read the same thing three times. So my reading comprehension. <laughs> Not so good. 
not so good. It's gotten easier the more titles I play because there's the the language used in them is very similar from game to game. Yes. So it it they're a lot faster to read now than it was when when I first started. No, you're you're definitely true, and the newer ones coming out are only getting better, which is mm -hmm. good news for those people. Like Chesapeake was great, um, twenty four. The rule book in twenty four was very good as well. So, I it's nice to see this forward progress all across the board. So so enough of this. Let's move on to the yellow phase. So in the yellow phase today, we are going to discuss the map and the market. Let's see, Tony is testing out his German with his description of the map itself. Oh, you schmal. Schmal. <laughs> <laughs> it's eins schmal. I, I, eins, eins schmal. <laughs> uh, it, is, it is small. It, it's very reminiscent of Sicily, which will be, mm -hmm. well, I don't really want to bring Sicily up because I think that that's, a, it'll be its own show at a later time, and I don't yeah. think it's fair because I think they do different things completely. For sure. So, but size it's also wise, an island. It, they're both islands, and they have mountains. <laughs> there you go. Right? <laughs> um, so, so the map, it is small. There is a lot of expensive terrain in the center of the map because it has a lot of the mountains. There are some big revenue centers that only take one uh, token station, so they get a little tricky uh, in Kuroshu. Kur oh, man, I'm the worst. I, Kuroshio? I, thank Kuroshio? you. Kuroshio? Yes. I don't know. Uh, you, you, my you, Japanese is as good as my German. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> I, I shouldn't have watched so much Hogan's Heroes when I was a kid. That's my <laughs> problem. Um, you do not learn good German from that. You only get one station token. Uh, in there, so that's a little difficult. And then Kotohira costs for every single upgrade, and I, th I think it's like eighty bucks. So that's a that's a big ask uh, for especially early in the game. So sometimes you'll see it sit on yellow, and then two guys are sitting there looking at it, going, "I don't, I'm not going to pull the trigger to benefit you, and you're not going <laughs> to pull it to benefit me." And you know, it's like you upgraded, whole... so I can pay, I can afford my token. <laughs> right, and they, it, that's ultimately what happens, right? Is the person and, who can and four hours them. later we're still playing. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but also, tokens are super important in this one because they really allow you to be able to stretch across the map. And there's a lot of tight bottlenecks in this one as well. So, very important things. And the shares do float uh, in the game. The market is. The market's nothing crazy. Uh, let's pull that up real quick here so you guys can see it. The market is, that's your standard 1830 market. It's got a lot of ledges. So you can, you know, trashing stocks will only do so much damage. Uh, it does have the brown and the yellow area. Uh, so you can play, you can briefcase, uh, which we were talking a little bit about earlier and things like that. So pretty standard as far as that goes <clears throat> and shares do not bounce off the top if they're fully held and as in some games they'll just yeah. they just float up and sit there like a i don't know like an air bubble trapped by surface tension how's that, how's that? <laughs> so that's the map in the market so gentlemen what do we have to say about the map in the market well again uh small <laughs> small <laughs> compared to like 1830 I think a, a lot of it's kind of a one and a half D. <laughs> like if you look at it this way, the yeah, values there's, run, there's you know, so kind of the legends. same. So, yeah. um, so, you know, there's different, there's different increments, right? Like you're going to increment your share value faster along the top than you will in the middle or the bottom. Mm -hmm. But, um, but it's also standard movement. You're only ever going to move one box mm -hmm. one way or the other. You're going to drop if your shares are sold. But, you know, there are many times when we're playing this game where somebody's just, you know, trolling the bottom of the, just going up the steps like a salmon ladder across the bottom. So, Johnny, anything you have to say about the map or the market, sir? Uh, not much about the market. I think there's not much to say about the market. The map is even smaller than it looks, in my opinion, because you, you kind of, if anything, you cut through the mountains in one spot in most games and then you're kind of working around the perimeter yep so you know all these all these mountain 
spaces typically stay open the whole game. Mm -hmm. So the in terms of the amount of map that's actually <clears throat> available for for track building, it's even smaller than it looks. I think, at least yeah, in my six games, I haven't played a ton of it. But. Chances are the only person who's going to go through that center is the person who brought in the Mountain Buster Private, and they're probably. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you get three lays out of that before they close, you're lucky because it tends to once you get you're able to buy that guy in, you might be able to get three lays before it, it dies. I'm like I'm like, nah, you can get more than that. And I'm like, no, that's about how many I got. <laughs> it went very, very quick. So, yeah, and usually your your best routes don't start through them. Your early routes don't start through the mountains. So by the time you actually have an incentive to build through the mountains, you're getting pretty close to them closing anyways. Right. Cause everything's on the perimeter, right? Like, you know, all the, all the money's on the perimeter. It's usually just the companies that are stuck down in the Southwest corner that need to kind of break out and get up to the revenue centers up there in the, in the Northeast tends to be when that happens, you know, cause you want to set up for diesels because hopefully you're playing long <laughs> enough that you're, gonna see diesels in any event so i think this is a great time to bring on the green phase we're gonna we're gonna hop right through the map i think you can see that right away the green phase is all about the trains so we said earlier that the trains are your typical 1830 mix there's nothing crazy in here we do have the diesels at the end so you want to try and have those routes available but other than that it's about the same but we have one less company. John, do you want to do you want to kind of clue us in what can happen if you have, you know, one less company running the same amount of trains? What's a potential trap that can happen in this game? There's an interesting scenario. So there's with seven companies, uh, there's 14 spots for trains when you get to the point at which the six, t uh, six trains need to be bought. And there are 12 total trains uh, between the threes, fours and fives. So you can get you get to a point where there's only two spots available. You can get to a point at which you two players can be train tight, and another player could potentially be earning more revenue and not have a, have an incentive. Hmm. And then there's no companies to open in order to break the sixes. So you can end up in a game, and I'm probably not explaining it as well as somebody. <laughs> <laughs> else might explain it but you can get to a point where the three trains become permanents because you never end up being able to break into the six trains and i've had it happen in two of my six games and i think that's usually a problem where people didn't buy enough twos early on and try and move the trains along fast enough because you're like oh i can only run one why should i buy two you know that mentality it's like this one, you kind of need to drive those trains to drive the rust a little bit if you ever have hopes of getting to the diesel. Because you need to create yeah. those pockets in the company so that you can actually have room to buy the trains. Because it's not that you can't afford them. That's part of the problem, sure. But the other part of the problem is you're train locked. So if in the scenario where the person that can afford it is train locked and the person that can't right. afford it has a spot, I've heard of players actually buying a, a, a train across for a dollar just to free up the space for the person that can afford it. So that way that third player who's benefiting greatly from this situation uh, ends up having the sixes broken over them. Uh, so that that's something that, I don't know if we've talked about our thoughts on whether or not this is the best intro game, but I think that's one of the things that, one of the few negatives I have on this game for an mm. intro game is that it's not necessarily obvious to people. So you can kind of get stuck in this trap. The remedy that I've heard is you may just have to buy a train for a dollar from somebody and let them get access to the six. Yeah, and then you're you're only working with a seven thousand dollar bank, but if you're only running permanent threes and you're only running fours and maybe a, one or two of the fives are out, it's going to take you a long time to break that bank. And uh, how long do those games typically last that have these these huge stalls in them? First one uh, was about six hours, maybe maybe six and a half. It was it was pretty long and brutal. That was our first mm -hmm. ever game. Uh, okay. So we started off, like you said, oh, I can only one run one train now. I'm only going to buy one train. So right. like, it wasn't just the stall out. It was the fact that we were not buying fast enough. We had heard of the when in doubt, buy a train, but I don't think we were really living by that mantra. The second time it happened was actually in my most recent game of it, and that still was only about a four-hour game. So it wasn't too bad. Interesting. Now, Tony, you like to bring up 
the poisoned four. I don't. I don't think there is a more poisoned four than in this game. But by the same token, that four can sometimes run to the end of the game if nobody buys the diesel. So it's not that big of a pill to swallow. It's just, do you want to swallow it? Yeah. Um, I don't have a ton of experience with 89 either and only one play recently just, uh, and that was October. Oh, and, uh, in that game, me and my buddy Chuck just kind of, Nope, I'm not going to buy it. You buy it. Nope. I'm not going to buy it. You buy it. And eventually I bought it, you know, but you know, get the, keep the game going. But that that kind of, it kind of sucks. Right. You know, maybe that's a point where, uh, your comment, Chris, about like that four train could be permanent, not, you know, out at our table, right? We're gonna we're gonna engineer things if, if we have to to you know right. if you're making too much money and stuff like that. But that might be something to like to John's point where you know beginners aren't gonna you know just instantly realize that that's a way to do that. You know? The trains I think are one of the trickiest parts of this game to kind of get right, and I think they're also the ones that can really be brutal to new players. I almost think if I were doing the beginner game, I would leave the privates in and just export <laughs> and be done with it, right? Just export. If only there was a game that does that. If only. If only. <laughs> um, I mean, but we have to remember, I mean, this was designed many years ago. Not only have the, the games themselves evolved over time, so have the people playing them. You know, Absolutely. That, that's a big difference than when this came out. Right. I mean, what what did I say? 2004? Four. 2004. I didn't. I thought 18 XX would be some shady red light district thing. Like I had yes. no idea that it, it was a game like so, 18 XX is something you don't Google. No, no, it is. It was not. <laughs> so <laughs> don't even get me started. Uh, family friendly <laughs> show ish. So. <laughs> You know, I think that, yes, there are things and I'm, I'm kind of curious, you know, to see what Josh might do with the system. And I think he may play with the beginner version of this a little bit, because I think that yeah. the core game itself is good. But I'm curious to see if he's going to play with this beginner game sandbox before it comes out when he does the Kickstarter for it. I'm curious. Yeah, good thought. I, I hope so. Uh, it's certainly... Um... It could certainly use some improvement, the beginner game on this, and uh, could turn it into something pretty darn cool. Well, I also think it's interesting to say that, you know, John, you had to teach the game from the rule book, and you still didn't play the beginner game. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I guess your mileage may vary, but we're a group of heavy gamers. Right. And we typically anything that's labeled beginner, we probably aren't going to try. <laughs> yeah, that that I understand. I, I don't think I even knew that the beginner game existed until I read the notes on this episode. <laughs> <laughs> it might be it might be buried in an FAQ somewhere that that uh, I I didn't know about. Um, I did know there were the extra track tiles, but I don't think I knew about the other rule changes. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the track tiles do help um, because it is a very track type game. But I also think that's one of the things that's great appeal to it because I think it's fun to kind of reach in the bag and go, oh, man, there's no more of that left. That means I have to upgrade something so that I can free it up so that I can use it. And, of course, you hope that it's still there the next time you get to yeah. operate. Right? I love that part about, <laughs> about this game and, and any game that's like that, especially when you can... Uh, you pull it off, you, you flip it over. somebody by taking that tile right after they Nothing free to see it here. Nothing to see here. <laughs> <laughs> Throwing that big pile of stacks over there. <laughs> which which I will say doesn't work so well when you have the jewelry trays because then they're always on display and people can see it. So that Right. <laughs> it's kind of a drawback to organization there. All right. So let's move on to the brown phase. Now, the brown phase, we are going to talk about shenanigans. This typically tends to be the home of shenanigans. And uh, this game is going to be no different. However, it might be a very brief topic because I don't know that there is a ton 
of shenanigans. Now, Johnny, you kind of mentioned the one already, and that is that you can briefcase in this game. So do you want to maybe explain what you meant by that when you were explaining this to your new player? Sure. And I don't necessarily know if this is the easiest game in which to do it because uh, so for those that don't know what briefcasing is, it's when you open up, up a company and the requirement to own a train only applies once you have a valid route. So you point the track away from uh, from any existing track and you try not to connect it in. So that way you can you take that money and put it into one of your companies that already has a built up infrastructure. And it's a way to inject money into your established companies so they can buy new trains. And uh, the company I've seen it work with is the TKT, where you just aim a sharp back towards the um, southwest. And um, the, the problem is, is that people can upgrade you into the map if they have access to do that. So uh, it's a risky move, but it's one that is possible, especially if people decide to leave you alone and let you do it. So always the question. Yeah, right. Yeah. I, I've yet to, personally, I've yet to really make briefcasing work because A, I'm being too obvious about it. And B, the whole time you're briefcasing and you're operating, and correct me if I'm wrong, your stock is going down in value, correct? Mm -hmm. So you are losing value at the same time. And then I always wind up not knowing exactly when to pull the trigger to inject funds into another company without having to be on the hook for a train in that one. Now, this one I can see where it'd be good because it would allow you to suck a five out of something potentially and then be able to leave room for a six or a diesel down the road. But I'm, I'm, I'm 18xx stupid and I can't make it work. <laughs> I've tried. I just, I, I struggle. I really do. I definitely think if it's, if it's a map where you can't get a company that's isolated enough to make it difficult for some, I mean, if people have to have to hurt their own prospects by laying track just to just to tie you in mm -hmm. then you have a better chance of briefcasing working because you're hoping that they're focused more on building their own routes and not wasting their very few tile lay actions that they have in the whole game on screwing you but if it's very clear that you briefcasing is going to make you a runaway leader uh, then you may not. You may want to consider trying to make sure that company mm. can eventually get a permanent train, because, <laughs> like you said, yeah. you could end up being on the hook for a train for that company. Right. Interesting. Yeah, and no. I also i I'm that spiteful guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm building track over there. You know what though? In, I, in a game where you get one track lay, it's a little tougher. But when you get yeah. two, and you're kind of like, "Well, I'll put one for me. Oh, one for you. One for me. One for you." And then the you kind of method. But oh uh, yeah. But you know, Chris, you know, once you make that briefcase company unattractive, you can lower your investment in it. Sure. And then uh, you know maybe you can make lemonade by uh, turning it into a yellow strategy later if somebody. Build you some track, right? And I think that that's kind of the that's kind of the the whole milkshake, right? Like you need to have everything kind of lined up, and then you yeah. can because you you can't sell down too quickly because if you sell down too quickly, you know you're you're going to leave yourself vulnerable. Yeah, and somebody's going to come in like, oh well, that's a lovely briefcase. I I don't mind if I do, and they'll try and snag it from you. Especially if you sell the same round and they happen to have cash laying around. Yeah, don't you, do that. You, yeah, <laughs> yeah right. definitely don't do that. We, uh, we, we played with, uh, we actually encouraged somebody in our last game who'd never played before to brief case just to show him how it worked and to get him out of a situation where he was just, he was trained tight. He didn't have any money. Uh, he didn't really know what to do for the rest of the game other than just run what he had until somebody broke, you know, until somebody rusted his trains. So we showed him brief casing and, um, and he initially, you know, floated it and he's like, oh, why don't I just, why don't I just sell three of those shares? And I'm like, well, you just put a thousand dollars on that company's charter. Do you want to sell it down to two shares and have somebody take a thousand bucks from you? Not right. yet. Because that's where the whole, oh, I sell shares in a company and now I can't buy it back. And I've lost companies that way because I, I've been at the point where I had to sell one of something and I'm going to, I'm going to lose. I can't protect both. I'm going to lose one. So which one's it going to be? So not fun. 
not fun. So anything else on shenanigans? So you talked a little bit about yellow strategy. Do you, do you think it's viable in this game with this market? Do you, you know, with all those ledges, I think you have to go yellow early. And I think that kind of only works if you plan it pretty, pretty much from the get go. Cause otherwise you're, you're hitting ledges way out. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm not trying to do it in this game, but the yellow zone is pretty close to the to the par values. So, you know, it's probably not too difficult to get it going. Right. So it's like yeah, the, yellow the yellow doesn't is... count against the overall limit. Right. Of, you know, 17 shares or whatever it might be. Right. And the orange means you can have more than 60%. And it's also not sell by sell, as right. you brought up. Um, so you have to buy sell them buy or buy then sell. <clears throat> so how did how does that kind of factor into a, a game tony like for for our viewers at home uh, <laughs> what's the big difference between the two if you can sell first and raise the money to buy something that you're maybe you want to buy or uh you're probably buying just to sell it again at some point whether immediately arbitraging it or Maybe you're going to be a little more, more greedy and, and buy one or two more and then bef and then sell them, depending on what you're after. Hmm. Um, so it's, you know, it could be a little bit meaner and um, and quicker, basically, to get to the results, right? Like if I got to buy and then sell, but I can just, you know, buy, sell, buy, you know, or sell by sell, you know, it's a little bit more expedient to get to the results you're looking for. Do you guys see a lot of stock market churn in this game? I, uh, my last game, I don't remember a lot of that happening at all. I haven't seen a lot of strategic arbitraging, but I, I, this game has made me really dislike games where you can buy and then sell because I see a lot of finger waving just for the sake of doing it. Like, oh, I can, I can buy a stock and sell it in the same round in, in the same action yeah. and just not get bucks. down a peg. Yeah. <laughs> and, right. and I think I, I prefer when it's, uh, sell then buy because it forces them to take an entire extra action and lose priority in order to to trash stock. I definitely agree. I I've been doing it five years. I still consider myself a newish player, um, and I hate hate to see my stock trashed. It it drives me nuts every time. Oh, so it's an opportunity. It is. You can buy is. stocks cheaper. But you know, and I guess like, there's a silver lining in in. It, 1830 style games where those shares now will pay out into the company. So right, yeah, yeah. There's a cost to uh, trashing someone's shares, you know. Right. It's Sometimes not... we we'll see some tit for tat, right? Like I'm, I need to change the operating order, so I'm gonna I'm gonna sell. Then you know that'll just trigger the other guy to sell, so right. he's back on top of the you know. So sometimes we see a little bit of that churn. But at the same time, I don't I don't think that there's so much that relies on turn order in this game. I mean, I think there's a couple critical like track lays, like being the first person in, in a specific city to be able to get a token or something, but I don't think it's like super cutthroat either, if that makes sense. Does that, without, without yeah. trying to like water it down too much, I don't feel like it has, like trashing someone's stock for turn order, I, don't feel has as much impact in 89 as it does in a lot of other games is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Okay. I haven't played okay. enough of it to know, but I've seen it be fairly important for some of the, some of the critical tile is like uh, Kotahira hmm. in oh, uh, token placements. Yeah. Yeah. For token okay. placements. Yeah. So. I, I'd like to be the guy to buy the first four train after I run my twos, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of stuff. So there, okay. there's times there are, there are indeed times. And and there are times when 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 you gotta have feelings. So I think uh, no, I'm I'm working on segues here. I'm work, working on them. Um, apparently they're a thing and they have to be good. I don't I don't know. I just I think that was excellent. Oh well, thank you, thank you. I mean, it's probably it's probably like a joke you don't have to explain. It's better if it just kind of happens naturally and you don't point it out. <laughs> but. <laughs> Let's move on to the gray phase, even though technically we kind of we don't have gray tiles, but we do have a gray phase because there are off board locations go. This one does something funny, and I I'm just going to bring that up because we're we're here right where the off boards have an upgrade 
revenue if you run a diesel to them. Nothing else get up, upgraded. Even though diesels are running, doesn't mean that you get that amount. You only get that amount if you run a diesel to them. So that's kind of, a, I think, a unique thing in this game that it does. Yes. So it doesn't, if you have that five and somebody's running a diesel all over the land, uh, you could you could have a, a company just do really well right at the end if you're not watch, not too careful, right? Feelings. So let's go around the table and kind of kind of see what everybody thinks about it. You know, there is a new version on the horizon. I think that that's kind of exciting because this is this is still a very popular title, and I think it does. There is a place for it in this day and age, so I think it it fits that niche. But uh, let, let's go around and let's start with you, Tony. What are your um? What are your feels when you think of eighty nine in general? Meh, whatever. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's like um, we don't have to love everything. It's okay. No, it's right. no, and I, I, I certainly don't uh, have great love for eighteen eighty nine. You know, I, you guys talking about number of plays and everything. I looked at my spreadsheet: three hundred and fifteen. Only five have been eighteen eighty nine. Wow. Uh, it, gets overshadowed a lot in our group. There's just other things we'd, we'd much rather play even on a school night. It is, it is you know, a quick game, and it does definitely fit into a, a school night type of scenario. My first bankruptcy ever was in 1889, so it has, it has a little bit of uh, charm to me in that respect too, right? Because, uh, because that was really cool. I'm like, oh, crap, I went bankrupt. Oh, my God. You know, it was, it was the first time. It was a lot of fun. I, I would say the one thing I'm looking forward to trying is um, – I've played a lot of two-player 18xx games, mm -hmm. and uh, it's the only thing I keep track of is my 18xx plays. I don't keep track of my Euro plays and stuff. But 46, I've played 46 different, well, sessions, not not necessarily titles, 19 different titles. Um, but none of them have been two-player 1889, and I think I should uh, I think I should fix that um, and give it a whirl at the two-player mark. And you know, I, I'm probably still going to be meh, but you know, whatever, you know, I, I certainly don't dislike the game or, and I wouldn't say, oh my God, no, I don't want to play it. Right. But right. it's just not the first thing the hand reaches for on the shelf. That's fair. It's completely fine. So Johnny, what are your, uh, what are your feels on this one? Well, first of all, uh, the derailed guys talk very favorably about 89 at two players. Mm -hmm. So I haven't tried it at two cool. either. I have pretty similar feelings to, to Tony. I mean, I haven't played 315 games. I've only played 32. Um, That's not a lot. Six of, six of them have been 89, so a decent percentage of them have been 89. I think it's my my second most played game. I like it. I like it as a game to introduce people to the genre because I think it does – it shows you a lot of different – it has a, a wide breadth of strategies available to you. I think, you know, it, it can be, it, JC talks about it, it can be a revenue game or it can be a stock value game. And I, I definitely agree with that depending on how the game plays out. I think that it forces you to shuffle trains around. I like that there's no restriction on what you can sell a train for. I, I don't like games that restrict that. I think that's a really valuable thing to teach people how they can pull off some shenanigans. I like that briefcasing, while maybe not the easiest thing to do in this game, is possible. I think my big caveat with this game as a beginner's game is that if you're sitting down all new players, it can be a pretty long, drawn-out process. So I think the game is best as an intro game when you have an experienced player at the table to kind of drive the games sure. a little bit. And I think uh, nice. having read the rules of 18 Chesapeake <laughs> and not played it, I think that game may do a little bit better at a table with all new players because of the export and the extra company. I think you're less likely to have a stalled out game with 18 Chesapeake than you are with 89. Uh, that Absolutely. being said, as much as I think 89 is a fine game, uh, I find myself being drawn to shinier titles. So I don't find myself really dying to play 89 very much. Uh, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'd rather play 1880 or 62 or something with a little bit more flash to it. And, um, I don't know if that's just the type of person I am, <laughs> but uh, 89, if I was going to use a word to describe it, I'd say vanilla. That's fair. Yeah. And I'll kind of round out our feels and it's, I, I'm not going to say that I, I'm, I'm the lover of the group still enjoy it. I had a lot of fun with it. 
And I, I respect what it does, right? Like 89, I think, does what it's supposed to do with, you know, the train thing being what it is. I haven't had that game because I didn't teach all new players or things like that that lasted six hours. That would, if I were playing this game six hours on this small of a map, that would drive me nuts. Um, so I, I can certainly see exactly what you guys say. I... I love the fact that this is very accessible and I think it is very easy to teach. And this might be that first game that people are able to start getting in on school nights. You know, it maybe it's not their their first game ever, but it's one that they can get to the table and at least learn how to play a little faster and not hinge on every decision and think about every track lay permutation possible and what you're going to do for somebody else because I think that can really bog down those first plays and I think if you can help somebody get over that faster I think you'll get them into enjoying titles a lot sooner. Uh, I also think it's it's probably the the single most accessible print and play Maybe outside of 1800, I I printed 1800 and I I don't even know that I have it anymore. I'd have to look over on the shelf, um, but it, I think it's it's one that you can get. And uh, I know Tony does not like the Carthaginian tiles, um, but I do like a pretty game. And while I agree that the tile sets on the other ones are much more obvious and they help a lot with decision making right like i think you look the other ones are pretty and it's nice and it, it looks gorgeous um yeah but i think you pay for that because you you do pay for a slowed down game pace because people don't know especially when you're new right you don't know what those greens look like let alone the browns don't even get me started on what you know the picnic tables and everything that the browns look like it gets crazy but I think people need to have that. But I think this guy is, if you're really looking to get in and you're looking to get in on not the ground level, ground level is go to your game store, buy 46, right? This is basement level. Like you're in the mail room printing this game so that you can play it. I think that's where 89 is stellar because you can actually craft this you can make it and you can see if this is a system you love. Did I make my point? Yeah. I don't I don't know if I'm yeah, winning think, you over. I don't need to win you over, but I think you print Karth's map and then get the tiles off of Kelson's tool. <laughs> what he said. I have no <laughs> idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to know something, sir. Are you disparaging 1846? No, I'm just saying that in, <laughs> of the 18xx titles available, that is probably one of the most accessible because it's something I can walk into my local game store and grab on a shelf. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. I don't have to pay cool. hundreds of dollars I, doing some shady yeah. back. Aid, I, back is that still deal. the case? Um, yeah, maybe not now. <laughs> yeah. Maybe not. I think now. it's harder to get now. Yeah. 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 But I just heard something about bottom rung or something. And I'm like, what? <laughs> no, no. That That's starting ground level. Like 46. Yes, is like, level. I can go buy it and I can get playing it. Right. Okay, okay. Whereas 89 is I have to build it and then they will come. Right. Fair <laughs> like enough. It, so you're not just Fair showing enough. up at a ballpark. <laughs> I, I will say, though, you know, I, I'm very much looking forward to Grand Chunks edition. And I, I do intend to purchase it and support that effort as well as I agree, you know, play the game on that copy. And it's going to be really interesting because we're going, you know, if, if he continues down the same path as he did with uh, 61, I, I think you're going to see that hybrid map, right? We're going to see the pretty and the functional. Yeah, it's right. going to be pretty functional. I <laughs> see what you did there. I like things that look good on the table. And yeah. I, I like what, what Josh has done or Grand Truck Games has done with the, the double-sided tiles where you have the plane on one side. But I like that even the stylized side is still yellow background, green background. It doesn't have right. the plain background with the colored track, which I think is much harder to parse on the table, but it has just a little bit of texture and a little bit of style. And I like that. And I think um, Lonnie's games do something very similar where there's a little bit of depth 
to the to the track, but it still right. has the colored background. And I like stuff like that. And I'm I, I think the new edition of eighty nine is gonna look great. I yeah. agree. I agree. I'm definitely excited for it and uh we're gonna see what happens. So <clears throat> so we, we have to bring this home with, with, with the priority deal. And uh so so Tony those of you who are new to the show, Tony likes to have a shelf in his in his basement that is dedicated to the priority deal markers for every game that he loves. There, there's even ones that don't even require a priority deal marker happen to have them. So Absolutely. <laughs> um, and short of getting like, you know, a small like little trophy case bottle of sake for this, uh, I, I'm kind of at a loss. Uh, for me, like what I would get, but I, I do. You, I don't recall seeing anything when I was out there, Tony. Do you have anything for eighty nine uh, that might fit? I, I don't. Uh, I typically okay. just use this little guy, which just is the, uh, the standard little choo choo pencil sharpener. Yeah, it's a it's a pencil sharpener, so you can, and then fill out the score sheet if your laptop's you not go. nearby. You know, we yeah, we've but, actually done that at a game store. <laughs> I can't do that on mine because I super glued the door closed on the back. <laughs> yeah, I did too, but you can just kind of knock it out of there. <laughs> there Fair enough. Fair enough. Johnny, is there any any kind of thing you would recommend for being the first the priority deal marker for this? Like what would you what would you get if Oh yeah, you, I mean you're doing the reprint. What what would you want in the box? I think uh I think the answer is pretty obvious to that one. It's the train <clears throat> shuffling poker chip. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's Get a supply I, over I, to Josh. I, I don't know what it would be. I've yeah. not put a, I've not put a unique priority deal marker in any of my games until 1880, and I took the little, uh, the little dragon out of um, Vast. Okay, that's a red dragon meeple. You know, that's it's the only game I put a special priority deal marker in. Uh, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that because uh, that's kind of what started this whole mess. Because back in the day, Tony came on Game All Night. I had him on the show and we we talked a lot. And he legit in the mail sent me like a, a small Chinese dragon that is now my first player token for 80. And moving on from there. So, you know, that... That means a lot that you picked eighty to get a marker for, because yeah, yeah, we'll we'll let you stay in the tribe if that's if that's the case. Appreciate it. <laughs> no problem. You know, ideas could be like a, a Japanese dragon or like the gates. Don't they have like a? I can't remember. Yeah. I don't remember what they're called. I need my friend Matt here to tell me all the Japanese words. Yeah, no, um, you know, a little samurai or something. You know, so so Castle. interesting. So you all prepped maybe by reading the manual or playing the game. I prepped by going on Amazon Prime last night and watching the entire James May Visits Japan uh, show. There were like six episodes. It was actually very interesting. So if, you, if you're kind of interested, it really helped me understand a little bit about the geography and the culture, whether it's, okay. you know, through old white guy eyes, as it were. But it was... Uh, definitely interesting and i think they're uh they're kind of choo-choo train crazy crazy over there aren't they a bit right don't they great trains trains, from the 70s great trains it's insane so i i don't think 89 is the last one to come out of japan but it's uh it's definitely the most popular i would argue at this point excellent so so, gentlemen, this has been a ton of fun. So I'm excited to kind of see what happens with this in the future. I know we're on the, the cusp of great things happening with it. And hopefully, if anything, if you're curious about what the game does or anything, we gave you some insight into, you know, maybe some pitfalls. Avoid the train stalemate in the middle of the game there if you if you do play it yourself. And, uh, you know, don't hesitate to go find a print and play copy. Now, I won't tell you exactly where to get that, but it's not exactly that hard either. So, you know, use your Googles and figure it out. So um, let's do that thing where we go around and we tell everybody where to find us. So, so Johnny, um, guest of the show, 
you've already mentioned your your you're pimping your swag on the show a little bit. <laughs> so so why would somebody want this swag? Where can they find you? What do you do? So yeah, so train shuffling, we don't uh, we don't cover a title uh, for each episode, and what we've done. Uh, we've done a little bit of everything. We've done a lot of first impressions. Mm -hmm. We are actually just about to start moving into a little bit more strategy-based discussions, but not uh, not high, not deep strategy, but more of uh, hey, I've I've played a, a couple dozen games. I want to start to elevate my thinking in these games. Uh, what do I do next? So uh, we're really geared towards towards people like us who've only played a couple dozen games, a few dozen games, and uh, just want to start figuring out how to think a little bit more strategically and less tactically. Awesome. And Love it. Uh, what I, what I really like about, about what we do is our YouTube channel. I think that being able to play a game, have people see the game and then have us discuss it afterwards on the podcast is really cool. So that's a board game informant. And we actually started it prior to doing 18 XX streams, but now it's turned into almost exclusively 18 XX. <laughs> Indeed it has. <laughs> we don't really want to play much else. <laughs> I think we might do like a cube rails night or something like that, but oh, like, fun. yeah, we're, yeah. So I think we can, we could knock out like three or four of them in one night, I think. Oh yeah. So, Rock some Irish gauge. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love Irish yeah. gauge. It's so good. Oh yeah. Man. Cool. <laughs> game. My cool uh, game. friend brought a uh, golf mobile in Ohio. Oh, um, nice. a couple times. That's a uh, that that's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's lots a of great games of Chicago games. Express, uh, which I've liked, yeah. and I just got German Railways, which I'm really excited about. Cool. Okay, cool. Haven't haven't tried it yet. Yeah. Well, the uh, the Golf Mobile in Ohio, I think, is getting reprinted by Rio Grande, if I'm not mistaken. So that'll be that'll be good yeah. times and good stuff for you. And then, of course, we have uh, you know. Capstone's doing Ride the Rails, which will be coming out in the spring, I think. I think it's shooting for June, so that'll be exciting as well. Awesome. And where can people find you, sir, if they want to? Let's say you have something witty and funny to say. How sh how would they go about finding you? Uh, we're uh, at BoardGameInformant at gmail.com or at BGInformant on Twitter. And we're also uh, facebook.com slash board game informant. There you go. And just to let you guys know, and, and anybody that's listening, we are doing a special stream on March 18th. I hope I got the date right. It's it's that Wednesday. I'm pretty sure it's March 18th. Okay. But we've actually been asked by Marflow to do a playthrough of 18DO Dorman. Ooh, which oh, nice. They're kickstarting Dorman. sometime this spring. Make so we're really excited about that because it'll probably be the first time anybody will have a chance to see that being played. That's awesome. So, right? I'm excited yeah, for that. It has beer in it. Come on, guys. It's got to be good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's got to be Heat, sweat, and beer cool. is the uh, subtitle for it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> right on. Uh, and Mr. Tony, where can people find you on the internet if they want to follow your witticisms and be jealous of all the gameplays you get in? Uh Mainly Twitter at a Fryer Games, A F R Y E R G A M E S. There you go. And uh, yeah, board game geek. I'm Tony Fryer. Woo! Woo! Wow, that's a that's yeah. exciting. That's a classy one. It is. It is. <laughs> it's easy. It's not like you know. I don't know. I'm trying to think of some really bad board game geek names, and nothing's coming. Well, to mind. it reminds me of this old joke um, that. The, the Secret Service used to say that Al Gore was so boring that his code name was Al Gore. So, <laughs> so Tony Fryer. There you go. My BGG name is Tony Fryer. Yeah. Nice. Um, and I have been Chris Whipan. I am the host of Game All Night, which is a the late night board game talk show. You can find us over on YouTube. Uh, and I spell night N-I-T-E. So you can find me at Game All Night Show. Uh, you can find this show there uh, until until it's self-sufficient and breathing, uh, which, my goodness, you guys, you guys download this show like there's nobody's business. So thank you very much for that. Uh, if you want to consider supporting us, we do have a Patreon available, and we always welcome that. Thank you to everybody who has supported in the past. Uh, and it's just 
patreon.com slash wheel tapping quick and simple uh and everything goes straight into the show and last but not least tony i'm excited i'm excited you know why i'm excited i think you know tell me sir i i'm i'm excited because we are going to do tracks east this year uh the paperwork is showing up this week uh we are locked in to do tracks east and it's going to be and, and I'm sorry, Johnny, because I already heard that, that you can't make it, which sucks, but it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. It means you're only five hours away. I get it. Uh, but <laughs> it's going to be Labor Day weekend. It's going to be Saturday through Sunday, uh, or sorry, Saturday through Monday. We're going we're gonna to slip that extra day in there. And if you want to come out early, I'm thinking Friday, we're going to arrange a trip to go up to see the Strasburg Railroad Museum and be able to go check out like the PRR and everything that kind of comes out of there. So I think it'll be a little fun. If you want to get out early, we'll try and do that. More information on the streams and you can find it out at wheel tapping on the Twitters. I will put it out there. It's, it's only going to be for, for, for train nuts. So, you know, if you like trains, you want to play train games, we got you covered. Got you covered. Got you covered. I'm excited on the East coast now. On the East Coast, right? Yeah. No, what's right. funny is, did did you see some of the people giving me guff? Because wait a second, if this is tracks East, does that make Denver West? No, <laughs> I'm like, it makes well, Denver. It's, it's west of me. <laughs> <laughs> that's tracks Prime, right? <laughs> that's just tracks. It's just tracks. <laughs> that's that's just it. So Tony's which been is gracious. like in two months. I know. I, I oh man, and I looked and flights are cheap. I'm I'm. Uh, if I, if I didn't have to fix the car, I'd be out there in a minute. But it'll hey, be exciting. Run something during the week and I'll be there. Well, you know. Friday's during I work week. weekends now, so. I don't. It's, uh, yeah. Weekends suck. <laughs> they do. Trust me, I just spent the last 30 years of my life working weekends. I understand. Well, On enough the of that. Side, I get four days off, so. <laughs> See, now I want to ask what you do. But we'll, we'll do that <laughs> off mic. All right, that's it for wheel tapping. Thank you all for hanging out this long. Enjoy your your car ride, your trip, your next train game. Have fun, and we'll see you next time on wheel tapping. To the table. Pull up a chair at punchboardmedia.com. Punchboard